everyone to this um, afternoon session on key agreement and commitments. So the first talk is on the worst case inefficiency of continuous group uh, key agreement. That's worked by Alex uh, Binstock, Evgeny Dodis, Sanjam Garg, Garrison Grogan, Mohammed Ajabadi, and Paul Rosler. And Alex is going to give the talk. Okay. Yeah. Uh, thanks for the introduction and thank you all for being here today. Uh, okay. So the motivation for this work comes from secure group messaging. Uh, obviously, this is a very real world uh, primitive used by billions of people across many applications, Signal, WhatsApp, et cetera. Uh, and in fact, it's gained a lot of attention from both the security and the crypto communities recently, uh, you know, especially through this recent standardization effort of the ITF called uh, the messaging layer security. Okay, and of course, the basic functionality is that users are in groups, they can send messages to each other, and also they can uh, remove one, in, one another from the group and add new users to the group. And important for functionality is that users can go offline sometimes. So if you're if you're on a plane, obviously uh, other people can communicate to you directly. So users send messages, some delivery server sitting in the middle, buffers these messages for other users, and then when users come online, uh, this server delivers these messages to them. Okay, and of course we want standard end-to-end -end security with respect to non-members, and this includes. Uh, those users that were removed right before a message was sent, what was sent, and also those that are added immediately after the message was sent. Okay, and in fact, we also want some more robust security properties, uh, which I'll talk about on the next slide. Uh, but first, I just want to mention that uh, continuous group key agreement or CJKA from the title slide uh, is at the core of secure group messaging. And so basically, for each add and remove operation, uh, it creates a new shared secret, which only the current uh, members of the group use to encrypt messages and more. Okay, so now let me talk about this additional security. So this is security uh, with respect to state leakages. Uh, and what, what I mean by this is if we have this uh, uh, timeline of, of the session at the bottom, uh, we uh, the adversary can say at time equals four, uh, I want to corrupt some user, and they can uh, make this corruption last until some time t equals eight. Okay, and importantly, this also includes uh, any randomness that the user samples during this time. And so the security properties that we want here. Uh, oh, sorry. And also, uh, because of this sort of corruption, we also allow users to periodically issue these so-called state updates, which will allow them to heal from these corruptions. Okay, and like adds and removes, each such operation uh, will also create a shared secret. Okay, so uh, the first security property we want with respect to these state leakages is forward secrecy. So that means from time to equal zero to four at the bottom, uh, we still want security, even though the adversary corrupts uh, the user at time t equals four. Okay, and then also on the other side, we want post-compromise security, which is sort of the focus of this talk, uh, which means that once uh, we reach time t equals eight and the user is no longer corrupted, if this user issues a state update, then sort of everything from time t equals a on should now be secure again. Okay, and so there are a couple of subtle but very important properties that come from uh, this PCS notion. Uh, the first is what we call double join prevention. So this sort of captures a scenario where uh, maybe we have some protocol that instructs users to delete certain uh, randomness that they sample from time to time. But maybe we have a malicious user that during this time period decides that they're gonna defy the protocol 
and keep this randomness instead of deleting it. And so, of course, what we want is even if this happens and this user is removed at time eight, then everything, uh, everything in the future should still be secure. Okay, and then sort of similarly, uh, maybe this user isn't malicious, but there's some virus or some implementation flaw that leaks the sampled randomness during this time uh, to the adversary. And again, what we want is if this leakage stops and the user updates at time eight, everything after time eight should be secure. Okay. Uh, so now what do we want from efficiency? Well, ideally we want logarithmic uh, or at least sublinear in the number of users of the group. And in fact, some protocols do claim so-called fair weather login. And what this sort of means is that under some good conditions, you get logarithmic efficiency, but there's no worst case bound that's been proved for any protocols. And these so-called fair weather conditions are also never really defined anywhere. Okay, and in fact, all known schemes actually have worst case linear communication, or sorry, efficiency. And this is even for communication, so not just computation. Uh, and even holds amortized over long periods of time. And the main result in this work is that we show any CJK scheme that's black box from public key encryption must suffer from this kind of worst case inefficiency. Okay, uh, so now uh, I'll give a high level summary of how some of these existing schemes work and sort of where they go wrong. Uh, and hopefully here also I'll be able to provide a lot of intuition for, you know, how our lower bound actually applies to any CGK scheme. Okay, so basically most protocols, at least those that claim to be efficient, uh, can be grouped into the so-called tree chem family. So as you might guess, these are tree-based protocols where we have user key pairs at the leaves of the tree. And then we build on top of these leaves where each interior, each interior uh, node is, is a, another key pair. And at the root, we have uh, uh, basically what serves as the shared secret at some time t. Okay, and of course yeah, the public keys can be known to all, but we want this, sort of ideal invariant where the secret key at a given node V should only be known to its descendants. So if we look at SK1 here, it should be that only C and D know it, but for example, A and B should not know it. Okay, so now for an example operation, let's say B updates. So first of all, B will delete everything on its root sorry, on, the, on, the, on its path from the leaf to the root, then sample a new leaf key pair, sample a parent, encrypt the secret key to the, to the other child, then sample a new, root, a new root, and encrypt this root secret to uh, both of the children of the root. Okay, and so this is nice, we get log efficiency, uh, but now let me tell you where things start to go wrong. Okay, so let's say that this user D adds some K users. Okay, and we of course can make K equal to omega N. And importantly, let's assume that these users remain offline for a long period of time. Okay, so we have some K users uh, over here. And the protocols sort of vary on what to do here. Uh, some basically just directly encrypt uh, this secret to these K users, while some maybe more efficient schemes do actually build some structure here. Okay, but the main thing to notice is that even if there is any structure here, it's all created by this user D. Okay, so now if A removes D, because of our security properties, we can't trust that D deletes this. And so we have to completely throw it out. 
Okay. And so what this means is that A needs to somehow encrypt a new secret to omega K independent or exactly K independent public keys. And so this should intuitively require uh, uh, omega K communication. And yeah, so just to go back, like no matter what scheme we have here, anything that these K users know must have been created by this removed user D. So yeah, in, in, in any scheme, basically this user A is just left with communicating with K independent public keys. And so this basically provides the basis of, of the even more general uh, lower bound. Uh, okay, and then yes, also we can sort of continue this forever. So maybe after A removes D, maybe B removes A and so on. You have to sort of add some more users in between, but yeah, you, you basically you can continue this forever under the right conditions. Uh, okay, so now before I go into a bit more detail on the lower bound, uh, I want to recall that really this omega k communication comes from this strong but standard PCS requirement we have. Because precisely we can't trust D to delete this old structure. Uh, if we did, then we could just keep this structure and we would always have log efficiency. So it's really this property that uh, gives us the lower bound. Okay, so now a little bit more detail on the general lower bound. Uh, the first step that we do is we abstract out a so-called compact key exchange primitive, which exactly captures this communicating a fresh key to K independent public keys. Okay, and sort of the main technical meat of our paper is showing a black box separation uh, that shows that this primitive cannot be achieved black box from PKE uh, with little O of K communication. Uh, and yeah, but unfortunately, I don't really have time to go into the details on this too much. So I'll give like a two bullet point summary. Uh, so if this ciphertext that is communicated to these K users is short, intuitively, you can only really fit a small amount of base public key ciphertext uh, uh, in here. Okay. Uh, yeah, and this is like closely related to non-uniform random oracle lower bounds. Uh, and so because of this, what the users have uh, at their disposal to, do, to decrypt is basically a subset of the uh, secret keys that can be used to decrypt the base public key ciphertext. Uh, and so there's some correlation here because every each of these K users can't have uh, each a unique secret key. And so an adversary that can basically run the initialization uh, algorithm a bunch of times can successfully recover this correlation and therefore uh, decrypt the ciphertext. So yeah, obviously it's like much more complicated than that, but that's like the very high level summary. Okay, and then of course the last step is showing that CGKA actually implies this primitive uh, and moreover implies it tightly in terms of the communication cost. Okay, and this pretty much exactly corresponds to the sequence of operations I showed on the previous slides, because again, uh, if D creates all of this structure and then D is removed, we can't trust any of the structure anymore. Okay, so then, yeah, this, this user A is just left with communicating to K independent public keys, which is exactly our CK, CKE setting here. Uh, yeah. Okay, and we also generalize this a bit more. Maybe it's not just one user D that adds all of these users. Maybe it's a few and then they all get removed 
And so, yeah, you get like the same flavor of lower bound, uh, maybe like slightly lower amortized over uh, a, a few operations. Okay, so yeah, just to conclude, uh, we, we show that all CGK protocols black box from PKE must suffer from this worst case omega n communication, even amortized over long periods of time. Uh, and also in the paper, we have another result that shows that there's no single CGK protocol that can perform best on all sequences. So what I mean by this is uh, if you give me a CGK protocol, I can always choose a sequence and there will be another protocol that performs much better on the sequence than the original protocol. Okay, now just to leave you with some open problems. Uh, one obvious thing is to prove the lower bound with respect to stronger primitives or assumptions than just PKE. I mean, obviously this seems like a very strong primitive. Probably you need like IO or something to get actual like logarithmic efficiency, for example. Uh, so yeah, this is a good question. And then also on the more practical side, can we prove better average case communication upper bounds? Uh, but sort of the problem here is we don't really know what sequences are average necessarily. And furthermore, if you look at like the trivially good sequences, which are like just all updates where we can get logarithmic efficiency, these are very different from something like one user adds a bunch of other users and then is removed. So sort of figuring out what sequences are average maybe has to come through like empirical data uh, that we can analyze. Um, and then, yeah, last thing is also just like this last point kind of ties into our additional result because like every protocol sort of has to choose what they want to handle efficiently. But like if you don't know which sequences will show up more frequently, then it's hard to know which which sequences you should cater your protocol to. Um, so yeah, that, that's it. Thank you. Right. So thank you. So maybe we take one quick question while the next speaker sets up since we're already a couple of minutes behind schedule. So one question, feel free to ask. I didn't want to discourage you. So. All right, so thank you, Alex. All right, so while Brent sets up, uh, let me introduce the talk. So the next talk is on adaptive multi-party Nike. Uh, it's joint work by Venkata, Kopula, Brent Waters, and Mark Zandri, and Brent is going to give the talk. Okay. Um, for, yeah, thanks for um, uh, having me. I'm Brent Waters. I'll be talking about adaptive multi-party non-interactive key exchange or um, Nike. Uh, so the idea of non-interactive key exchange is that um, any subset of users can um, derive a shared secret without interacting with each other. For example, in this case, we can imagine, uh, let's say users um, A and B uh, are able to derive um, K sub AB. Now, if you zoom in a little bit more, what actually happens is they'll both generate, every single user in the system will um, generate a um, public-private key pair, keeping the secret key to themselves and then posting the public key on the bulletin board. Um, then after that, uh, what'll happen is um, any user that has their own secret key along with the public keys of everyone else in the system can run the key generation procedure and um, come up for the um, shared secret. So notice these two users arrive at the same point even though they kind of uh, travel different ways to get there, right? Um, so intuitively, the security says that um, an adversary shouldn't be able to guess what the secret is if they don't own any of the users um, in this particular set. Okay, so the title of this talk is about adaptive security. Um, so first, let's uh, see in a little more detail what this is. Uh, this is going to be a game between a challenge and an attacker where the attacker can make uh, multiple types of queries. Um, the first one is the attacker can say, hey, please create an honest user for me. 
in which case the challenger will generate a key pair, give the public key to the attacker and mark this as uncorrupted for now. Uh, the next type of query is the attacker could say, hey, you know, that honest user, I actually want to corrupt them. So point at their public key and then the challenger will give them the corresponding secret key and we mark it as corrupted. And then finally, another key, uh, another type of query called um, generating a shared key, where the attacker will give a um, set S for some uncorrupted set of users, and then it'll get to see um, the shared shared secret case of S. And it can make a, many of these queries, um, can be in, well, in any order that makes sense at least. And then after doing all this, um, the attacker comes forward with a set S star, and the challenger will either give the key for S star, the shared key, or something random. And the attacker's job is to guess which one of these two situations happen. And we're going to say it's secure as long as the advantage of guessing this should be um, pretty like negligibly close to one half. And we'll have the natural restrictions where, you know, you, the set S star cannot include, let's say, a corrupted user, for example. Okay. Okay. So um, you might ask, well, why do I care about adaptive security in this situation? Well, the first one is I think it, it is the most robust definition possible, right? You know, users make certain decisions. This might impact their you know, impact their decisions of what other things, actions to take, so on and so forth. And I think if we're, you know, kind of honest with ourselves, I think a notion like selective or static security, I do believe it's meaningful, but usually we put that out because it's hard to get the adaptive definition, right? Not because we thought it was the right thing in the, in, in the first place necessarily. Um, so that's the reason. Also, uh, it's kind of an interesting problem that comes up in, if we're going, let's say, from selective security to adaptive, um, if there's a, if we have n users in the system and we do two party key exchange, we have to take this uh, without better ideas, let's say, we have to take this um, n squared uh, loss. But when you want to do um, bigger party key exchange, let's say n user uh, l users, then your loss actually grows exponentially with l, right? And um, this necessitates complexity leveraging, sub exponential hardness, and um, that part of type of thing. So that, that's kind of why I find it interesting, at least. Uh, there's actually pretty rich literature around party uh, Nike. Uh, the first is obviously the famous Diffie-Hellman um, uh, two-party key exchange protocol, which uh, led, among other things, to uh, public cryptography. So that was a, a good win for us, right? Uh, and then Ju in 2000 had this pretty interesting assumption. You know, we always hear about bilinear maps now, but at first they were thought to actually do bad stuff, right? You know, they, they're an attack. Um, so he was the first one who kind of said, hey, maybe we can do something more with that and show that you could do three party key exchange. And then I won't go, whoop, uh oh. Um, and then I won't go through all these, but like coming in within the last decade, we've seen in general for what I call L party key exchange, things from multi multilinear maps to obfuscation. Um, usually with selective security, a couple of the ones at the end did claim some form of adaptive security, but this was under some type of interactive assumption where like, okay, if I say this, then I'm allowed to ask for this and, not, and then I can ask for that. And like, it's not just like, hey, I get my number theoretic assumption, I have to solve it. It's this back and forth thing. And I would argue at least qualitatively, this isn't, I mean, it was interesting to see, but like it's more pushing the problem of ad adaptivity into the assumption rather than like, you know, taking a static assumption and trying to, you know, solve it uh, what, what is what I would say. Um, but there's a reason for this given by Rao in that uh, she showed there were some uh, black box barriers for getting security from uh, non-interactive assumptions. And um, however, it's limited to what she calls admissible reductions or admissible constructions, pretty much things where once you publish your public key, the public keys were published, it would fix what the only answers could be for, um, for the shared keys, right? And um, the constructions up to until this point were admissible as, as she called it. But you know what we want to ask ourselves is okay, let's let's break out of that paradigm and um, see what can happen. Okay, so here's our results and contributions. Um, there's going to be three of them, although I'm going to just focus on one for this talk. Uh, the first one is that we have a set of generic tools to simplify the problem of Nike. We kind of reduce the case of Nike with setup to the case of Nike without setup, or maybe the other way around. I might be saying it wrong. Um, and then what we do is we can also get rid of, using other techniques, get rid of the shared key queries just to like um, make the problem easier, right? Simpler to deal with. Uh, the middle one is what I want to focus on. Uh, we show pretty close connection between um, Nike and adapt what are called um, adaptively secure um, constrained functions. And we show that constrained functions for the special class plus obfuscation will give you multi-party Nike with um, some bounded number of user, users. Uh, 
uh, about a number of uh, corruptions. And then we also show how to build this from obfuscation uh, plus the decisional Diffie-Hellman problem in, in, in non-bilinear groups. Okay, then finally is a more direct construction. Uh, but this talk is going to um, focus on the middle part. And what I like to do is do a little bit of a pivot here, even though the talk's about Nike. Uh, for the rest of it, I'm really gonna talk about constrained PRFs. I'm gonna kind of ask you to believe me that if I built this type of constrained PRF, that it would be the solution for non-interactive key exchange, right? So um, first of all, non let me introduce constrained PRFs um, to people right here. Uh, constrained pseudorandom function is like a regular pseudorandom function, like we see up here, right? There's takes as input the key uh, and the input and outputs a value y. But what you can also do with these things is you can um, kind of restrict them. So if you have this master key, you can call this constrained function along with a circuit C, and it comes up with a new PRF, which will work on all inputs where C of X is equal to one, okay? It will give you that answer, give you the same answer as the master key. However, if C of X is equal to zero, um, I really shouldn't know what the um, answer, be able to compute the answer. And moreover, I cannot um, distinguish it from a random value. Um, this is actually um, uh, introduced by three research about a decade ago. Okay, so for Nike, it turns out that um, what we need is a constrained uh, uh, PRF for a special class of functions. Um, here, the inputs are going to be not bits, but more from a larger alphabet. Let's call it sigma. And it's going to be L symbol. So we're going to think about L symbols um, over sigma. And the constraint is pretty simple. It's just going to be um, specified by a position I between 1 and L and uh, symbol Z. The idea being like, uh, if the ith position of the input is equal to Z, then you can figure out the PRF. And if it's not, you can't. And that's uh, that's it, right? So that, that's the constraint that we're going to be interested in. And you'll, um, due to lack of time, you'll have to kind of believe me that this is uh, useful for Nike. Okay, so if we kind of figure out the security game for constrained PRFs, for what we're talking about, challenger would choose a master public key, as you might expect. Adversary gets to make adaptively many different queries of, let's say, a position and a symbol. We'll get back the corresponding constrained key, can do this over and over again. And then finally, at the end of the day, um, it's going to give you a challenge X star that isn't easily satisfied by, trivially satisfied by one of those keys from before. And we're going to get back either the PRF or a random value. And again, we want to argue that it's hard to be able to distinguish these with better than one half guessing, right? Okay. So um, what I'm going to do in the um, time we have here is try to give you some idea how we constructed these things. Uh, we constructed them from indistinguishability obfuscation uh, plus DDH. Uh, we're going to use kind of a Nora Reingold, sort of a Nora Reingold variant um, of this. So here the, for the key, for each position and each symbol, we're going to um, choose a random exponent E sub I comma W. Okay. And then we're going to also have a random base H. And the valuation of the PRF, um, as I have it up here, is to simply do a subset product based on the symbols. So I look at the first symbol, look up what its corresponding E value is, then look up the second symbol, the corresponding thing, multiply them together, um, and so on and so forth until I uh, multiply um, L these exponents together, and then I take H and raise to that. Um, so pretty much nor, almost nor wrangled, right? Okay, so the construction of the constrained PRF is pretty simple itself. It's actually the proof that gets a little more complicated. Uh, so think of this thing in green here as the obfuscated program, and it'll be parameterized by a uh, index I star and symbol Z. And uh, the way it works is that the first you look at the input and you say, well, is the I star symbol equal to Z? If not, reject because we're not supposed to be able to answer it otherwise. And if it is equal to Z, then you go ahead and you, I guess, just do the computation, right? V is equal to the product of all these things according to X. And then you take H and raise it to the V. Um, so hopefully that's pretty um, straightforward. Okay, so to actually prove it though is kind of hard, is, is somewhat difficult. And so if you look up here, right, we have this, eventually in the challenge, we have this base H. And if we could kind of make this disappear from anywhere else um, in, in the stuff above it, uh, it would just be true. Like it'd just be hard to distinguish, right? If the base H only came in at the very end. Uh, but it actually is part of these constrained keys. It's like, you know, um, shoved in there somewhere inside an obfuscated program, but at least to start it's there. Uh, so what we're gonna do from our proof is to take this H out one by one um, from the constrained keys and try to replace it with something else, okay? 
So um, let's see. So the, kind of the idea is um, originally the, the programs come with some, you take um, uh, H and raise to the V. Instead now for the ith key given out, I'm gonna choose a new, somehow after several hybrids, I'm gonna change it so that it has a different base and raises that to the V instead, right? And if I can do that for all the keys, then this original H is just uh, not related to any of them at all. Okay, so I wanna change them one by one from using this core H value or this thing from the public key to, uh, not from the public key, but um, uh, from the challenge to something else. Uh, there's kind of a problem though, in that if we try to do this as I outlined, there will be consistency issues. So imagine that like, uh, okay, so an attacker gets two of these keys, and it thinks of one input that both keys should answer. Well, it could, it could feed that input into both obfuscated programs and it, it should get out the same answer, right? Like it, otherwise, you know, when the heck is going on here? Um, but it, it, it won't, right? If, if we kind of do the proof like this, it will get H1 to the V here and H2 to the V, well, we timed it just right with the zoom thing, but um, uh, uh, so the H2 to the V there, these will be two different things and the attacker you know, we'll say, hey, when the heck's going on? I'm, I'm, I'm quitting, this looks different. Uh, so the idea is that we're gonna kind of do this, but be um, each new key will be deferential to the previous ones. Okay, so first I'm gonna give out the first key and change its base to H1 via a bunch of DDH stuff and IO and, and all that stuff. Then when I give out um, the key for let's say H2, or sorry, for, for the second key, by that point, I know what the first constrained key was. And essentially that second program will say, look at this input, if it could have been answered by the first program, use H1. If not, so I'll kind of defer to it. If not, I'll use my own um, thing, uh, my, my own new generator itself. And then for the third key that's given out, it first looks at the input, say, well, could it have been answered by key one? Okay, if so, use H1. If not, ask about H2 and, and, and be deferential to that. And if, if not, then, um, then I get to use my H3. And this way things are consistent. Like there's not like a natural, obviously my proof is, is wrong type of um, deal going on. Uh, this type of proof idea is also though why we handle right now just a bounded number of, of, of corruptions because on the ith query, I need to say, hey, this is what happened in the previous i minus one one. So I have to kind of put it in there and it would be obviously good to um, get by this. Okay, so um, in summary, so using IO and decisional Diffie-Hellman, we constrain the key, we change them one by one to use a different value, but um, getting consistency is pretty important. And we have to kind of do this, I guess I call it deferring to the previous, to the previous things. Um, and then, you know, we do jump around, we do jump around these previous um, so-called impossibility results, which would have held even for a bounded number of query, um, corruptions, by the way, um, since the PRF is not fixed. Um, by the public key. And um, just to conclude, uh, the things I find kind of interesting are, could you remove the bound and the restriction of the group size? Right now it's just an obfuscated program, not an obfuscated Turing machine, just obfuscated cir circuit. So, you know, you, you can pick any value you want, but you have to pick some value at the beginning of how many users get together. And um, perhaps probably even more challenging, could we remove the bound on the number of corruptions? Uh, right now this technique at least in my mind, seems to be pretty heavily tied to having a bound on the number of corruptions. And um, I, I think it would take some significant new insight into this, or you know, maybe you can prove it's impossible under this, this, or that. Um, okay, so I try to get through, uh, did I make it on time? Okay, wow, okay. So um, th th thank you, everyone. <laughs> All right, any questions for Brent? Yeah. Thank you. I mean, there's a microphone. Yeah, no, oh, oh, there's another one. Yeah. Oh, okay, we switched all of them. Okay. <laughs> okay, good. So around constraint PRFs, uh, is there any gap between the selective version uh, of the notion in terms of assumption versus the uh, adaptive version uh, of the notion that uh, you were able to get? Oh, okay. Um, so yeah, I think there's a little crackling there, but. Um, yeah, I think for, yeah, no, I think essentially the same problem happens in cons these constrained PRFs and Nike have similar issues where, um, yeah, I think, I think for general functionality, for example, um, from IO, I could build it pretty, pretty easily for um, any functionality if it was selective, for example, and then adaptive. 
have to think about that a little bit. But yeah, adaptively constra constrained PRFs is a, is a problem. And we solved it for this one particular class. But uh, yeah, you know, for more, for more broad classes. Oh, one particular class plus bounded corruptions. So um, it, it is also a problem there. If getting, uh, you can just speak loudly. Yeah, right. just speak loud. Yeah. Okay. Good. Good question. So it's it, it's in those proof. You know, I said I changed it to HI. Um, it, it's where that happens. It's sort of that it's c commutative in a sense that. Um, let's say I'm focused. Uh, um, I'm focused on the ith hybrid in changing. Um, the ith user's key, pretty much what will happen is that um, e value I will not have in the clear and I'll have h to the e. Um, and uh, the fact that it's commutative, I can kind of move things. I'm not explaining it too well, but um, I, I do rely on kind of the algebraic properties. Probably not. I mean, I imagine you could try to abstract it out. I, I'm not sure. It would be very enlightening, but yeah, I, I imagine you could say, well, any PRF with such and such property, I, I wouldn't claim nor Rheingold is the only way ever to do it. Yeah. All right. So I think we, thanks. We'll move on to the next talk. If okay. there's a, yeah. Thank you. All right, so the next talk is on the impossibility of algebraic uh, vector commitments in pairing free groups, and that's work by Dario Catalano, Dario Fiore, Rosario Gennaro, and Emanuele Giunta, and Emanuele will be giving the talk. Okay, thank you for the introduction, and welcome everyone. So uh, first of all, let me uh, briefly remind what vector commitments are, giving a brief definition. So vector commitments is a primitive that allows the committer to uh, commit to a vector of messages in such a way that after it gives the commitment, it's, it, is, it, it can actually open some position of this vector. So in this case, for instance, it can give an opening proof for position three and open to the message in position three and the verifier can later on check this. And same for position one and so on and so forth for, all, for each position of this vector. Now, the two main properties we want vector commitments to satisfy are succinctness, uh, which says that the commitments, this envelope here, uh, and also the opening proof have to be small and should depend at most logarithmically on the length of the vector uh, we started with. And position binding, which resembles the binding property of commitments, which says that given, uh, uh, I mean, it's very hard to open this envelope at two different positions. How does this work? Okay, here. At two different positions, uh, sorry, at the same position for two different messages. Uh, now, uh, nowadays we have like construction of vector commitments under several assumptions and settings. Uh, we have several from pairing or from groups of unknown order, recently also from lattice assumptions and from us, I mean, we have like Merkle trees, which is, uh, I mean, also considered vector commitments, but we don't know much uh, about what happens in prime order groups uh, without pairings. So in this work, we study essentially what happens in this setting. And in the rest of the talk, I'm gonna say that a vector commitment is algebraic if it builds on a prime order group uh, of known order without pairings uh, in a black box way. And its uh, security only comes from art problems within the group. Uh, so to be more specific about what I mean by black box, uh, here I said that the vector commitment could be instantiated in the Maurer generic group model. Uh, which is an idealization of a group. And essentially, instead of having operation explicitly, you have two oracles, one for addition, that is the group operation, and another one for equality. Of, I mean, one way to check if uh, group elements are the same. And as opposed to Shoop group models, uh, which is often confused with, in this case, we have no element representation. So we don't have random element representations. We only have element endles that are not really given explicitly. Um, Okay, so one reason, by the way, uh, vector commitments in this setting, like building black box from a group would be interesting. It's because they would, I mean, they would likely uh, retain the morphic property of the group. So, uh, I mean, one, one way to have uh, morphic uh, vector commitments would be to use a group in a black box way. And another interesting property is that compiling these to snarks is likely going to be more efficient. And also that's why we started looking at this problem in the first place. Uh, however, uh, the question is like, do these primitive exist? And unfortunately, I'm here to tell you that unfortunately they don't. And in particular, uh, we have two negative results. So in, in the first result, uh, we somehow restrict the verification procedure by only checking linear equation. 
And we say that in this setting, like they just don't exist. Uh, either there is either they're not position binding, or if they're position binding, they're not succinct because this lower bound here applies. So at least one of either the length of the commitment or the opening length has to be square root of n, where n is the length of the vector I'm committing to. Oh, sorry. Uh, and the second result, which is the one I'm going to focus in the, re the remaining of the talk, uh, it's a black box separation, says, uh, which says that uh, even if we don't restrict at all the verification procedure, uh, we still have the same issue. Uh, either the uh, either uh, the vector committee we have uh, is position binding against an inefficient adversary that only used the group efficiently, or uh, this lower bound here applies, so it's not succinct anymore. Um, nice. So in order to get there, uh, we basically start with a previous work, uh, which essentially provides uh, an impossibility results for algebraic signatures. So the same question, but for different primitive, that is digital signatures in Maurer's group model. And they basically show that for a large class of signature, uh, I mean, these primitives cannot be built. Uh, so what we do is essentially start from there. Uh, we build digital signatures from vector commitments. We show a nice constru uh, construction, not so nice actually, from uh, digital signatures from vector commitments. Uh, then we describe an attack for for digital signatures that capture also uh, the one that we construct from vector commitments. In some sense, we also close some gap that was left open, like we remove some limitation that was previously used in the verification procedure. And finally, we conclude that vector commitments are impossible. So that's the high level idea of uh, our results. So uh, the first step is to build digital signatures from vector commitments. And the way we do this is basically by building a signature with polynomially bounded message space. Essentially, the message space is going to be the indexes of the vector commitments. Uh, and in order to set up uh, the signature scheme, we have first uh, the signer deciding like random messages and committing to them. And this commitment is going to be the verification key of the signature scheme. And in order to sign a message, say the index three or index one, the signer can simply open the vector commitment. And this is a signature for say the index three. So if you want to sign the message one, you can simply open the vector commitment in position one and so on and so forth. So now the question is, uh, is this uh, signature scheme unforgeable? Now, as it turns out, unfortunately, it may not be unforgeable. <laughs> so they, they, I guess, again, this, this construction is not so nice as it may seem at first sight. And the reason is that vector commitments in no way implies that it's very hard to compute these openings by itself but only say that it's very hard to compute two different openings for the same position. So one easy counterexample of a forgeable signatures built in this way uh, could be, for instance, by taking any vector commitments you like and appending to the commitment the opening for the first position. Now, if you want to forge mess a signature for one, you just have a forgery already in the verification key. But interestingly, this is still a vector commitment, right? Because uh, this part here is succinct, openings remain succinct, and it's still very hard to compute uh, two different openings for one position. So unfortunately, they are not unforgeable. Uh, so we ask a different question. So the attack we found uh, that makes this unforgeable uh, comes from the fact that openings and commitment may leak information about other openings and other, uh, other openings in other position, but this uh, don't, cannot contain too much information because they have to be succinct. So the question is like, can an adversary who makes not so many query produce many forgery? And we define this notion as theta unforgeability, where the adversary has to come up with theta forgery instead of only one in the standard definition of signature uh, security. And in fact, we answer that this is indeed possible. So an adversary who tries to break this signature scheme cannot make too many forgeries, although it can make some of them. So it can make some forgeries. Uh, so this is the first part. The second part is like proving impossibility of algebraic signature, like uh, extending the previous results. And we are standing in three different dimensions. So the first, in, uh, okay, the first step is that we extend uh, what was known for unforgeable signatures to fit unforgeable signatures. So we also capture this weaker notion. And um, okay. And also uh, we observed that the previous results essentially gives a lower bound of the message space of secure signature uh, which depends on the number of group elements in the verification key. Now, in our construction, the verification key is composed by the commitment and the CRS. And the commitment is very short, but the CRS is actually very large, and that's problematic. So to make our impossibility, uh, I mean, our result works, we need to exclude the group elements in the CRS in these lower bounds. So this is one technical contribution. 
And the second one is we remove this limitation. Like in this previous result, they first they assume that the verif uh, verifier only can check linear equations. Uh, we remove this and assume that the verifier is simply any generic algorithm in the generic group model. So in particular, as a corollary, we also obtain that uh, signatures with large message space are not possible in Maurer uh, GGM. Okay, so to put all together, uh, we essentially have that we build uh, signatures from vector commitments, uh, which are theta unforgeable for some parameter of theta. We obtain that signatures are impossible. And as a consequence, if vector commitments are position binding, we obtain that they have to satisfy this lower bound, which comes from these bounds on the message space and uh, the values of theta that we derive in our paper. Um, okay, so just final slides. So in conclusion, we, uh, we essentially show that uh, if you want to build vector commitment in a black box way from prime order, from prime order group and without pairings, uh, you cannot do this, unfortunately, uh, if you want them to be both position binding and succinct. And the same result applies as well to polynomial commitment, any primitive that actually implies vector commitment. So polynomial commitment and functional, functional commitment also are captured in our, uh, by our impossibility results. Uh, and this is essentially just one way to say, one big way to say that there is no free lunch in computer science. Uh, I mean, if you want to uh, build vector commitments in this setting, either you have to use the group in a non-black box way, uh, or you need to use other assumptions on top of group theoretic assumptions. So finally, we also leave some open problems that is study what happens in Shoop group model. Well, there you actually have random group element representation and situation. And I mean, it becomes harder to study and there are actually some construction in this case. So it would be interesting to know what happens and that's it. So thank you for your attention. I had a quick question. So can you say more about the extension to Schub's GGM? Because I thought there it's sort of, maybe that's what you meant by there exist some constructions. So you could abuse of the group encodings to build a hash function and then have a Merkle tree, right? Indeed, yeah. You can yeah. build like, uh, you actually can build like random oracle such function. You can build right. Merkle trees. You can build also uh, Pedersen and on top of that use bulletproof. There are many possible things. Uh, but all these things have logarithmic, op have logarithmic opening. And mm -hmm. it's not clear if we can have constant opening, uh, even in the random oracle model, for instance. This is this would be even more difficult to study, but uh, it's still an open question. Uh, and that, that's what I mean here. By Thanks. Thank you for the question. Yeah. Are there any more questions? Can you achieve 12 Can you repeat the question? I can repeat the question. I can repeat it. Okay. okay. Uh, so the question is like whether the lower bound we achieve is tight. And yes, we show that the lower bound is tight and it's actually achieved by Pedersen commitments. Uh, you can uh, essentially break your long vector in square root of n sub vectors and Pedersen commit to each of them. The commitment is going to be square root of n because each, each commitment is, gonna, is constant, so it's square root of n size. And each opening is just opening the vector, com the Pedersen commitment uh, element you want to open to belongs. So square root of n opening uh, openings. So thank you for the question. All right, let's thank the speaker again, and then the next speaker can sit. Sure. All right, and the the last the last talk is on four round black box non malleable commitments from one way permutations, and that's joint work by Michele Ciampi, Emanuele Orsina, Orsini, and Luisa Siniscalchi. And uh, Michele will be giving the talk. Right. Thanks for the introduction. Okay, so non malleable commitments. So let's start the talk by not introducing commitment schemes. We all know what they are, and let's talk about non malleability. So. Uh, in non-malleable commitment, like we are interested in this scenario, um, where we have a sender and a receiver, like in the sender notion of commitments, and a man in the middle. The man in the middle um, may receive commitment from an honest sender, and now he may tamper with it, which means like he can flip some bits or he can do something maybe smarter. Um, then he will send if we will forward this commitment to the receiver and uh, this commitment now may contain either a valid commitment so which means that uh, it's a commitment that admits an opening 
uh, or maybe not. Uh, but what we want from a nonvaluable commitment is that this message M prime should not be related with the message M that was committed by the sender. Okay? So um, this notion is particularly important, like uh, uh, in particular, like if, if you want to construct a multi-party competition protocol with minimal round complexity, um, most of the protocols rely on nonvaluable commitments. And but uh, even if you want, for example, uh, realize uh, I don't know uh, an auction, for example, using commitments, like you should use nonmalable commitments, like normal commitments, they, they don't work. So you need a form of nonmalability. Um, so in this work, we are interested in normal, constructing nonmalable commitments in the play model, no CRS, no random oracle, and using polynomial time assumptions. So what do we know? So there has been a long line of research. And like in Fox 2012, like we got the first um, result, the first protocol that was cost and round. And moreover, it used the underlying uh, one-way function in a black box way. Okay. Um, so we had other works and we finally reached uh, um, a protocol that uh, consists of three round, which we know is also optimal. But unfortunately, um, all these works like um, relied on the underlying one-way function in a, in a non-black box way, okay? So ideally, we would like to get a, a two-round construction uh, that use one-way functions in a black box way, and that's not, not what we do. Uh, so we managed to go to four-round, okay? So it's still um, an open question whether we can go to, to three-round. Um, so... So the setting where we are is, is the following. So the man in the middle will receive an honestly generated commitment from, from the left, from the sender, and it will generate a commitment on the right. Now observe that uh, um, this commitment might not admit an opening. So it might be a commitment of both, we'll say. And it should be clear that the notion of normalability implies that whether, for example, a uh, man in the middle performs a good or a bad commitment on the right session, this should be completely independent from what it receives on the, on the left, okay? Um, so one of the main building blocks we will rely on is actually um, uh, what we call a weak normalable commitment, which is a normalable commitment that it uh, remains secure as long as the adversary promises to never commit to to bot, so as long as as long as the adversary performs a good commitment, this object is uh, nonmalable. And um, in uh, uh, a work of Fox 2014 of Goyal et al., the authors provide uh, this commitment, which uh, uh, moreover has a nice extractor that uh, we can run to extract the message committed uh, by the man in the middle. Okay. So now we said that this commitment is secure as long as the adversary provides a well-formed commitment. So the natural idea to lift the security of a weak nonmalable commitment, a fully secure nonmalable commitment, is to say, okay, let's attach a zero knowledge proof. So now the receiver will accept uh, only if the zero knowledge proof is accepting. And the soundness of this proof guarantees that uh, if the receiver accepts, then the weak normalable commitment is well formed. So now we would like to argue that this stuff is secure. And to do that, we would like to, of course, rely on the security of the underlying normalable commitment, but we cannot do that straight away because I mean, the randomness and the message is used by the sender to also compute the zero knowledge protocol. So uh, we need to do um, proof through hybrids, and the first hybrid, uh, in the first hybrid, we say, okay, let's run the simulator of the zero knowledge protocol, and argue that that's okay. Uh, now, note that the adversary might do the following: so he might perform an ill-formed commitment uh, on the right because he's modeling this proof. He doesn't know what's going on, but he just does that because he's modeling the the simulated proof he receives on the left. And, and now what we ideally would like to do is that, is that we want to use this behavior to construct a reduction that breaks the security of the, of the zero knowledge protocol. Because now we can use the, the fact that the, the adversary is computing to a bad commitment on the, on the right um, to distinguish whether a challenger is generating uh, uh, the zero knowledge proof using the simulator or using the, 
the honest prover procedure. So now remember we are in the plane model. And remember also that we have an extractor that we can use to detect whether the message is good or is bad. So we, you know, the idea is to say, let's run this, this extractor so we can detect what's going on. So this fails because um, the only way the extractor can work in this setting is by doing some rewind. And the rewinds are bad because if you now uh, you are doing a security reduction, the messages of the zero knowledge protocol are generated by a, uh, a challenger and the challenger will not reply to you to different, um, it, it will not allow you, allow you basically to reset. Like, and, and that's what you need here because now you might be able to, uh, to reply to multiple third rounds and generate multiple fourth rounds. And that's not how the challenger of zero knowledge works. So like it gives you only one, one transcript. So the way the authors uh, of Fox 2014, uh, of the 2014 paper uh, solved this problem is by saying, okay, let's use a stronger notion of zero knowledge that allows rewind that it remains secure uh, under these mild uh, reset attacks, let's say. The problem is that this protocol, it's uh, non-black box in the use of the primitives and also uh, like makes non-black box use of the, uh, of the weak non-malable primitive. So we take a different approach. Uh, I will not have time to explain uh, everything here, but basically what we do is that uh, we consider a simpler uh, sub-protocols to realize this um, this, um, the zero knowledge uh, proof. The, and each of these sub protocol uh, really enjoys a mild form of normalability. In particular, the main tool we use is this one, is this yellow, is uh, this pink box, which is just a proof of knowledge um, with a delayed input, delay input property. Delayed input means that uh, the prover does not need the statement and the witness to compute the first round. And it ha enjoys this property that we call adaptive honest verified zero knowledge with respect to community. Okay. So just a recap of the notion of adaptive honest verified zero knowledge. So in this notion, we have two words. There is the first word where the adversary um, picks the challenger, so picks the second round. Uh, the prover computes the first round, and then the adversary can adaptively pick a statement and a witness. Uh, and now the prover can use the witness and the statement to, to compute the, the third round. And then there is the simulated world where the simulator needs to compute these pink messages, in, but without using the witness. It's nothing, nothing, nothing special. It's just honest very fair to knowledge, but where the adversary decides the statement and the witness adaptively on the first round. And right, and what we want is that these two words are indistinguishable, so good. So in the notion we introduce instead, we, um, we assume that uh, the adversary is also generating a commitment on the right. And we require the indistinguishability on the joint distribution of the view of the adversary and of the committed message. So the distinguisher basically here now takes not just the view, but also the committed message. So uh, the main tool we use here, other than the weak normalable commitment, is also is an honestly referred to knowledge protocol with respect to a commitment where the commitment is uh, extractable. Okay? And now one could ask whether on you know the notion of honest uh, verified zero knowledge trivial implies uh, our new notion. And the answer is is no. And the reason is the following. So, as we said, we now consider extractable commitment. Uh, so the adversary is generating this commitment on the on the right session, and we have a challenger of honest verified zero knowledge, which is providing the ping messages either in a simulated manner or in an uh, honest manner. And now we want to run this distinguisher. Remember, the distinguisher here takes a simple view of the man in the middle and the committed message. We need to extract the committed message. Um, the commitment is extractable. That's great. We can extract. And now we can feed uh, the distinguisher and we can see what this, this, the distinguisher outputs. And in this way, we complete the reduction. So this is a very similar problem to the one I showed you before. We, because now to extract, we need to rewind. 
And if we perform a rewind, now we might need to ask the challenger, you know, please give me another third round, but for this new pair of statement witness. And the challenger, I mean, no way he will reply to you. Either the reduction manages to generate those, or I mean, the challenger will not give this to you. So instead, we construct a protocol that uh, it's secure in this setting. The way we do it, I will explain it this at a very high level, is by taking the BMR protocol, the multi-party computation protocol, um, and compile it using an MPC in the head uh, approach. So the nice property that BMR has is that it has a preprocessing phase and an online phase, where the preprocessing phase is independent from the input of the parties. And this um, basically gives you uh, the delayed input flavor. Um, and this gives you an, uh, a delayed input on a zero knowledge protocol. To go to the, to get all the properties we need, we combine this protocol with a special type of commitment. Um, and we get our final, uh, our final gadget. Um, so, so I don't have time to explain you how the other um, the other building blocks uh, work and how they interact together, but the main takeaway of this work is that rewind security uh, it's sometimes too strong because in the reality, like an adversary, ne it's, it's never managed to see to ask for multiple third rounds of a protocol and receive multiple fourth rounds. So. Uh, in, in these protocols, it's not like the adversary is stateful and can really record uh, all these uh, resets that it does. It's a reduction that does the rewinds. And so, uh, like the adversary is actually a bit less strong. So rewind security might be too much sometimes. You can do something weaker. For example, constructing a, primit a primitive that you prove it remains secure in, when running parallel with some other primitive B, which in this case is a commitment. And what remains open is that, uh, uh, yeah, we don't know yet how to do a three round protocol that uses black um, one way functions in a black box way. We know how to do that uh, using non black box, uh, um, using the one way functions in a non black box way. And moreover, the construction we have is secure as long as. Uh, you pro, um, as long as the sender sends one commitment and and the main limit generates one commitment, okay. So to extend this in a setting where the main limit can generate more than one commitment, it's it's an open it's an open problem. But we believe that using similar techniques, we might be able to uh, to achieve that. And uh, yeah, for more detail, like please give a look to, to our paper. And thank you very much. All right, so does anyone have any questions? So if you have questions, uh, we're going to repeat them. Don't use the microphone. All right, so I don't see anyone. Okay, so then let's just thanks all of the speakers of the session again, and we are having a break now.